Welcome to the proteomics course. Today we will talk about central dogma, basics of DNA, RNA and proteins. So, lecture outline is we will briefly discuss the central dogma, the structure and function of DNA molecule and structure and function of different types of RNA and then we will talk about proteins. So, let us talk about central dogma which is information flow from DNA to RNA to protein. Let us say we want to make a building in IIT campus which is in Poe area of Mumbai. So, the left side shows the map which shows that where this area is. So, DNA is doing something similar type of function, DNA is the genetic blueprint which contains only the information. Now, once the site is resided, then map has to be created for the building. So, RNA is the molecular photocopy which can be used on the site from the cell contractors. Now, the building has to be uh, prepared to do that something similar in the body is proteins which are the building material. Now, you need mortar and different type of bricks to make the building and similar type of function being performed from the proteins in body. So, if you look at this way DNA is providing the genetic blueprint, RNA is providing the molecular photocopy and then proteins are providing the building material. So, proteins can provide and transform the one dimensional information from the sequence to the three dimensional functional information. This orderly and unidirectional flow of information which is encoded in the base sequence of cells from DNA to RNA and protein that is known as central dogma. Although now there are many evidences that challenges the linear logic of central dogma, but based on the premises that DNA encodes mRNA and mRNA encodes the protein, one cannot deny the conclusion that genes are the blueprint for the life and proteins are effector molecules. Due to this fact, the central dogma has guided research at the systems level. Before we move on to uh, discussing about the structure and function of DNA, let me take you to some of the historical perspective, the milestone discoveries which are related to the DNA. So, first one is Mendel's law of genetics in 1865. Mendel gave very fundamental laws of genetics, the discrete factors which are now known as genes can transmit characteristics from one generation to the next generation. So, deployed individual must contain two copies of genes, each parent can transmit one copy to the next generation. After this hereditary loss from Mendel, lot of research started in this area and then one of the major milestone was DNA double helix structure which was discovered by Watson and Crick in 1953. Watson and Crick published a paper in 1953 in Nature and they described we wish to suggest a structure for the salt of deoxyribonucleic acid DNA. This structure has novel features which are of considerable biological interest. From that time, the structure and function of DNA has been a subject of great research interest in the field of biology. So, shown in the picture is uh, James Watson and I had opportunity to meet with him in Cold Spring Harbor. So, I have shown that picture here. Now, in 1966, Nirenberg, Khurana and Holly, they determined the genetic code. 
Another major milestone discovery was recombinant DNA technology, which was developed in 1972 by Cohen and Boyer. In 1977, the DNA sequencing methods were provided by Sanger, Maxson, and Gilbert. Now, let us move to the 1990s. One of the major interesting area of research in biology was cloning. So, cloning is producing a cell or organism with the same nuclear material as another cell or organism. Dr. Ian Valmont of Roslyn Institute and his colleagues cloned a sheep dolly, which was first large cloned animal from the somatic cells. During this time, the human genome project was initiated and many of the genome projects and especially the human genome project was completed in 2003, which was an initiative from International Human Genome uh, Sequencing Consortium as well as Celera Genomics. And now very recently, different type of next generation sequencing approaches have made sequencing so much fast and affordable that it is revolutionizing the biological research at the genomic level. So, after giving you the perspective some of the historical background, let us go to some of the basics of DNA, RNA and proteins. Although this is not the uh, directly linked to the proteomics, but to understand the concept at the system level, I think it is very important to refresh your fundamentals of DNA, RNA and proteins. So, deoxyribonucleic acid or DNA which stores and transmits all the genetic information is a long polymer of nucleotide monomers that assumes a complex double helical structure. So, main function of nucleic acid is the storage and transmission of genetic information and there are two major classes DNA and RNA. Now, nucleoside is when you have a sugar and base, when phosphate molecule is also added that gives rise to nucleotide and then nucleotides joined by the phosphodiester bonds give rise to nucleic acid as you can see in this slide. So, what are the basic components of DNA? We just talked about nucleotide which is a subunit of nucleic acid. So, it consists of nitrogen containing base, 5 carbon sugar and phosphate groups. The sugar and phosphate molecules play a crucial role in forming the linear DNA sequence or a structure. So, the three dimensional structure illustrate a very close connection between the molecular form and function of DNA. DNA is made up of three basic components, a sugar, a nitrogenous base and a phosphate group. The sugar and base are linked to form a nucleoside and attachment of the phosphate group results in a nucleotide. Many such nucleotide units are linked together by means of a covalent bond known as phosphodiester bond. This is formed between the 3 prime carbon of one sugar and 5 prime carbon of the next sugar via a phosphate group to give rise to a polynucleotide chain. DNA is composed of four different nitrogenous bases that are derivatives of the heterocyclic aromatic compounds purines and pyrimidines. Adenine and guanine are purines. The nucleoside of these bases are known as deoxyguanosine. Thymine and cytosines are pyrimidines. 
the nucleoside of cytosine is known as deoxycytidine. Let us now talk about DNA double helix structure. As I briefly discussed, Watson and Crick in 1953 deduced the arrangement of two strands of DNA and proposed a three dimensional structure. The double helix structure is composed of two intertwined strands which are anti parallel and non covalently attached to each other. The sugar and phosphate backbone lies on outside as you can see A is going to pair with T and G is going to pair with C which is very specific base pairing and these are shown with the red dashed line for the hydrogen bonds. Hydrogen bonding between the complementary bases of two strands of DNA holds them together with A and T being held together by two hydrogen bonds and G and C by three bonds. This base pairing is often referred to as Watson Crick pairs named after the molecular biologists who were instrumental in elucidation of the structure of double helix. These strands are oriented anti parallel to each other and twist around an imaginary axis to form the double helix structure. The process by which two DNA strands of a double helix separate from one another by means of breaking of hydrogen bonds is known as DNA melting or denaturation. Heating of DNA solution causes the strands to separate and the temperature at which half of the DNA strands are in the double helical state while the remaining half are in random coil configuration is known as melting temperature. The length of the nucleotide sequence and composition of DNA determines the TM. The two sugar phosphate backbones of DNA double helix are not equally spaced along the helical axis. This results in formation of groups of unequal size between the backbone. The wider of the two groups is known as major group while the narrow one one is called as minor group. Chargaff's rule states that DNA from any organism must have 1 to 1 ratio of purine and pyrimidine bases. More specifically, it states that amount of adenine is always equal to the amount of thymine and amount of guanine is always equal to cytosine. Three forms of DNA. DNA exists in many possible conformations that include ADNA, BDNA and ZDNA forms. A and B are right handed helices whereas, ZDNA is a left hand helix. There are 10.9, 10 and 12 base pairs per helix turn in A, B and ZDNA respectively. They differ in their overall structure propositions as well as in the proportions of their major and minor groups. After knowing the basics of DNA structure, let us talk about function of DNA. 
Replication is a fundamental process that occurs in all living organisms to transmit the genetic material from one to the next generation. The two copies of nucleic acid are synthesized from one parent molecule during this process of cell division in such a manner that each daughter cell obtains one copy of genetic material. Now, when we looked at base pairing in DNA that is one of the very important feature of DNA for the self complementarity. The DNA replication one DNA molecule is generated into two strands and each strand can act as a template for generation of its partner strand. The different type of models which have been proposed for DNA replication including conservative model, dispersive model and semi conservative model. According to the conservative model the two parental strands of DNA as a whole serve as a template for the synthesis of progeny DNA molecules. Thus, one of the daughter DNA molecules is actually the parental DNA while other daughter DNA consists of two newly synthesized strands from fresh nucleotides. The dispersive model of DNA replication hypothesizes that the parental DNA molecule is cleaved into smaller double stranded DNA segments which serve as the template for synthesis of new DNA strands. The segments then reassemble into complete DNA double helices with parental and daughter DNA segments interspersed. The content of parental DNA in double helix decreases with each generation. According to the semi conservative model of replication each parental strand acts as a template for the synthesis of new strand of DNA which is complementary to the parental strand. Each daughter DNA molecule always has one parental DNA strand and one newly synthesized daughter strand. Among the three replication models discussed, scientists Misselson and Stahl proved that the semi conservative model was most accurate. For this, they grew E. coli cultures for several generations in 15N containing medium so that the bases in DNA contained 15N instead of 14 nitrogen. Next, they transferred and grew the cultures for several generation in a 14 nitrogen containing medium. Throughout the period of growth, samples were taken cells lysed and DNA analyzed by centrifugation in cesium chloride gradient. The parent DNA showed one band in cesium chloride gradient corresponding to 15N DNA. The first generation daughter molecules also showed one band which was not at the same position as parent DNA. This corresponded to 14N 15N hybrid DNA while the second generation showed two bands one of 14N 15N and other of 14 nitrogen light DNA. These results exactly match the semi conservative replication model. To understand about DNA replication, I think it is important to know some of the terms which are mentioned in this slide. The template that is a polynucleotide DNA strand which serves as guide for making a complementary polynucleotide. Origin of replication, 
that is a unique sequence in genome where replication is initiated. Replication fork, this is a point where two parental DNA strands separate to allow the replication. Helicase, this is an enzyme which helps in unwinding a polynucleotide double helix using the energy which is derived from ATP hydrolysis. Primase, this enzyme catalyzes synthesis of a small pieces of RNA which is complementary to single stranded DNA that provides the free 3 prime hydroxyl end required for the DNA replication to start. The leading and lagging strands, the DNA polymerase can synthesize DNA only in 5 prime to 3 prime direction. Therefore, it synthesizes one strand which is leading strand continuously and other strand which is lagging strand discontinuously. Each new piece is synthesized on the lagging strand template is known as Okazaki fragment. DNA ligase enzyme, it catalyzes formation of a phosphodiester bond between 5 prime phosphate of one strand of DNA and 3 prime hydroxyl of another. Thereby, it covalently links the DNA fragments together during DNA replication process. So, in summary, the DNA replication process involves the DNA double helix that unwinds at the replication fork. The two single strands are produced, which serve as template for the polymerization of free nucleotides. The DNA polymerase polymerizes these nucleotides by adding new nucleotides to the 3 prime end of DNA chain. Since it acts only at the 3 prime end, polymerization on one template is continuous and produces leading strand. On the other hand, it is in the short stretches and discontinuous on the lagging strand. Okajiki fragment primed by a short RNA primer which is synthesized by enzyme primase, it provides a 3 prime end for the deoxyribonucleotide addition. So, where and when replication takes place and multiple events which are involved in this process have to be very accurate for replication to occur. So, let us see how DNA replication works in following animation. DNA undergoes semi conservative bidirectional replication, which begins with unwinding of DNA double helix. This is done by enzyme DNA helicase, which binds to the replication fork and unwinds the DNA using energy of ATP hydrolysis. As this occurs, the enzyme DNA gyrase relieves the torsional strain that builds up during this process in the unwound part of double helix. The single stranded binding proteins SSBs bind to and stabilize the unwound single stranded regions of DNA helix to allow replication to occur. Initiation of DNA replication is carried out by a primase enzyme, which synthesizes short RNA primer fragments. Since DNA polymerase is not capable of carrying out this process, the SSBs are displaced as short fragments get synthesized. Synthesis takes place in 5 prime to 3 prime direction such that the nucleotides can be added to free 3 prime hydroxyl group. Elongation takes place continuously 
in 5 prime to 3 prime direction on one strand known as the leading strand. On other strand replication is discontinuous with short primers being added as the helicase unwinds the double helix. Elongation is carried out by DNA polymerase third a highly processive enzyme. The short fragments synthesized on the lagging strand are known as Okajaki fragments. The entire DNA is unwound in this manner by DNA helicase with DNA polymerase third synthesizing the new complementary strands. The RNA primers are then removed and these gaps filled by enzyme DNA polymerase first. The Okazaki fragments on the lagging strand which is still have a neck between two consecutive fragments are then joined together by means of enzyme DNA ligase. Sealing of the necks complete the process of replication after which all the machinery dissociates from the DNA strands. Let us now move on to transcription of DNA and first talk about prokaryotic transcription. Transcription is a process by which information from a double stranded DNA molecule is converted to single stranded RNA molecule by making use of one strand as a template. This process differs slightly between prokaryotes and eukaryotes. More specifically in the prokaryotes it is done by the RNA polymerase which initiates the transcription by binding at the promoter which contain specific sequences at minus 35 and minus 10 bases before the transcription starts site at plus 1. RNA polymerase locally unwinds the DNA after binding and starts incorporation of ribonucleotides which are complementary to the template DNA strand. The chain grows in 5 to 3 prime direction until rho dependent or independent mechanism dissociates the polymerase and RNA from the template DNA. The eukaryotic transcription it involves initiation, elongation and termination phases of RNA synthesis which are having many similarities with the prokaryotes, but it has few differences. In the eukaryotic transcription there are three types of RNA polymerases, but only RNA polymerase 2 transcribes mRNAs and coordinates numerous events of RNA synthesis and processing. The only RNA polymerase 2 does not bind directly to the promoter DNA, but rather to the transcription factors one of which recognizes the Tata sequence in eukaryotic promoter. So, let us discuss the prokaryotic and eukaryotic transcription in more detail in following animation. Transcription is the process by which information from a double helix DNA molecule is converted to a single stranded RNA molecule. For the prokaryotic transcription to begin the RNA polymerase holoenzyme consisting of the core enzyme bound to the sigma factor must bind to the promoter region. The sigma factor is responsible for recognition of the promoter sequence. 
this binding results in a local unwinding of around 17 base pairs centered around the promoter region. At this point, RNA polymerase is correctly oriented to begin transcription from the plus 1 nucleotide. In case of eukaryotic transcription initiation, the RNA polymerase 2 binds to the promoter region along with several transcription factors which recognizes the promoter site. The first step is the binding of transcription factor second D. This complex acts as a binding site for TF second B which then recruits RNA polymerase second and TF second F. Finally, the TF second E and TF second H also bind to complete transcription initiation process. In prokaryotes, the sigma factor dissociates from the core enzyme by a process known as promoter clearance. Once it has synthesized around 9 to 10 nucleotides. The RNA polymerase continues elongation of new RNA chain in 5 prime to 3 prime direction by unwinding the DNA ahead of it as it moves and rewinding the DNA helix that has already been transcribed. The termination of transcription is signaled by controlling elements called terminators that have a specific distinguishing features. The prokaryotic termination can be rho dependent or rho independent. In rho dependent termination, one subunit of the rho protein gets activated by binding to ATP, after which the other subunit binds to the RNA transcript and move to the star transcription complex. The hydrolysis of ATP leads to release of the RNA transcript as well as RNA polymerase thereby terminating the transcription process. Another type of termination which is rho independent termination, it takes place due to the formation of hairpin loop structure by newly synthesized RNA transcript. The terminators for this mechanism have two specific features. First is a region on the template that will produce a self complementary sequence on RNA transcript located around 15 to 20 nucleotides before the expected end of RNA. The next feature is a conserved sequence of 3 adenine residues on template near the 3 prime end of hairpin. The formation of hairpin disrupts the weak AU interaction and allows dissociation of newly synthesized RNA transcript and RNA polymerase. Now, let us talk about a structure and function of RNA. RNA is made up of nucleotides A, G, C and uracil. So, difference from DNA is that uracil instead of thymine is present in RNA. Now, RNA is synthesized using DNA as template molecule. 
an RNA is intermediate in flow of information from DNA which passes on to the proteins. The functional component of molecular machinery is known as ribosomes which helps in the translation process. RNA is made up of three basic components a sugar, a nitrogenous base and a phosphate group. The sugar and base are linked to form a nucleoside and attachment of the phosphate group results in a nucleotide. Many such nucleotide units are linked together by means of a covalent bond known as phosphodiester bond. This is formed between the 3 prime carbon of 1 sugar and 5 prime carbon of next sugar via a phosphate group to give rise to a polynucleotide chain. RNA is composed of 4 different nitrogenous bases that are derivatives of heterocyclic aromatic compounds purines and pyrimidines. Purines include adenine and guanine while uracil and cytosine they are pyrimidines. RNA exists mainly as a single stranded molecule. The base stacking interaction often tends to make RNA assume a right handed helical conformation. Single stranded RNA also forms secondary structure by folding back on itself resulting in formation of loops and hairpins due to base pairing interactions. The functional RNA molecules often require a specific tertiary structure, the scaffold of which is provided by the secondary structure. These RNA due to their large negative charge are stabilized by metal ions. The messenger RNA is formed from a DNA template by transcription. This mRNA is often referred to as the pre mRNA in eukaryotes since it undergoes further processing to form a mature mRNA. A fully processed eukaryotic mRNA includes a 5 prime cap where the nucleotide at the 5 prime end is modified by addition of 7 methyl guanosine and a poly A tail at the 3 prime end which serves to protect the mRNA from degradation by exonucleases. The mRNA also contains 5 prime and 3 prime UTRs that contain signal sequences and serve as binding site for various proteins. The coding sequence is flanked by its start and its stop codons that define the beginning and end of the gene to be transcribed. The longer RNA precursors are modified by enzymatic removal of nucleotides from 5 prime and 3 prime ends to form the tRNA structure. Additional processing of tRNA such as attachment of 3 prime CCA trinucleotide unit and modification of certain bases takes place in certain bacteria and almost all the eukaryotes. All tRNAs have a common secondary structure represented by a clover leaf having 4 base paired stems. The anti codon loop recognizes the corresponding mRNA codon while the acceptor stem adds the suitable amino acid to the 
growing polypeptide chain. The rRNA is central component of ribosome involved in protein synthesis in all the living cells. Prokaryotic 70s ribosome is composed of 50s and 30s subunits, where S is a measure of the rate of sedimentation of respective components in a centrifuge. Our RNAs are derived from longer precursors known as pre-RNA. A single 30s rRNA precursor is processed by several enzymes to give rise to 16s, 23s and 5s rRNAs in bacteria. In eukaryotes, the eukaryotic 80s ribosome is composed of 60s and 40s subunits, where S is measure of rate of sedimentation of respective components in a centrifuge. In eukaryotic vertebrates, a single 45s rRNA precursor is processed by several enzymes to give rise to 18s, 5.8s and 28s rRNAs. The different classes of RNA, basically three classes, messenger RNA, mRNA, which is the least abundant around 5 percent of total RNA and it provides the template for the protein synthesis or translation process. Transfer RNA or tRNA, it carries amino acids in an activated form to the ribosome which is in the intermediate abundance and ribosomal RNA or rRNA which is major component of ribosome and provides catalytic and structural roles. So, what is the function of different classes of RNA in protein synthesis or translation process? Messenger RNA, it is a long sequence of nucleotides that serves as a template for protein synthesis. It is transcribed from a DNA template by RNA polymerase and gets translated into amino acid sequence of corresponding protein. The eukaryotic mRNA requires extensive processing to form the mature mRNA while prokaryotic mRNA does not require. The tRNA that is a relatively small RNA molecule involved in the protein synthesis process, it binds to an amino acid at one end and base pairs with an mRNA codon at the other end. Therefore, it serves as an adapter molecule that translates an mRNA code into a sequence of amino acids. rRNA, it is the central component of ribosomes and it has both catalytic and structural role in protein synthesis. The ribosomes that houses this rRNA consist of large and a small subunits. So, let us discuss how protein synthesis occurs in following animation. Initiation of protein synthesis is carried out by binding of mRNA to a small ribosomal subunit such that its initiation codon most often AUG sequence is aligned at the P site. The initiated tRNA that carried a modified methionine amino acid on its accepted stem then binds to the ribosomal subunit by means of codon anti codon interactions. The large subunit is then assembled on top of this to form the initiation complex. The other initiation factors 
are also involved which ensure correct positioning of all the components. The next incoming amino acid TRD carrying the amino acid corresponding to the next codon occupies the A site. A peptide bond is then formed between the amino acid in A site and the P site with P site amino acid being transferred to the A site. The unbound tRNA then leaves the P site and is moved to the exit or E site before being removed. Once the peptide bond has been formed, the ribosome moves one codon toward the 3 prime end of the mRNA such that the tRNA in the A site now occupies the P site and the A site is again free for the next incoming amino acid tRNA. Multiple such rounds of elongation followed by translocation of tRNAs are carried out to form the growing polypeptide chain. When the ribosome encounters the termination sequence typically UAA, UAG, UGA, a release factor binds to the vacant A site and the polypeptide chain is hydrolyzed and released. Other termination factors also aid this process. Once synthesis is complete, the ribosomal subunits dissociate from each other and all components are separated until commencement of next round of translation. So, in summary, today we talked about the importance of central dogma. We discussed about the basics of DNA structure and function. We then talked about basics of RNA structure and function. We discussed transcription and translation process briefly. We did not have enough time to go through the proteins, but in the next lecture, we will continue on amino acids and different levels of protein structure in more detail. Thank you.